Thanks everyone for joining today. My name is Andrew Shikiar. I lead marketing here at Fido Alliance. We're very pleased today to have a strong panel of experts to cover one of the hottest topics in Europe, which of course is how businesses around the world can best address PSC2 requirements. We have a lot of content to cover today, so I'm not gonna have too much of a preamble. Um, but I do wanna first introduce who's going to speak to you. So today's speakers will be uh, Jeremy Grant, uh, the Managing Director of Technology and Business Strategy at Venable. He's also a Public Policy Advisor to FIDO Alliance. Uh, Brett McDowell, who's FIDO's Executive Director. And then Alan Martin, uh, he's the VP of Strategic Partnerships at Jamalto. He's a Director of FIDO's Board, and he also co-chairs uh, FIDO's European Working Group. So these three uh, gentlemen will be speaking to you about uh, different aspects of PSC2 and what you need to know um, for your own business and also how, how FIDO is seeking to address these requirements. Um, before we start, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first and foremost, uh, this will be recorded and the slides and replay will be shared with you afterwards. Um, so that's always a common question that we get. Secondly, uh, feel free to ask short questions uh, via the, there's a go to, to webinar uh, question uh, dialogue on the GoToWebinar client. So we can answer those midstream. Uh, additionally, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. And so the way to answer or to ask questions during that session is to, again, enter them into the GoToWebinar client, and we will answer them as best possible uh, during the, uh, towards the end of, of our webinar. Any questions we can't answer due to time constraints or otherwise, uh, we will get, come back to you on via email. And last but not least, uh, you will see a survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, we ask that you take a few moments to fill this out. Uh, your feedback that really is critical to helping inform our webinar program uh, to make sure that we keep on delivering content that's relevant to, to your interests. So with that, I'm now pleased to start things off with Jeremy Grant of Venable and Pub, uh, Public Policy Advisor to FIDO. Jeremy. Hey, thanks and good morning, Andrew. So uh, our agenda today, we'll, we'll start. I'm going to give an overview of PSD2 and the strong customer authentication requirements. Uh, Brett McDowell will then talk about how to move beyond passwords with FIDO2, and uh, Alan uh, Martin from Jamalto will talk about some of the bank challenges and how FIDO can help. Uh, as background, uh, my name is Jeremy Grant. I'm here in Washington, D.C. at Venable. We're a law firm that works at the intersection of security, privacy, and payments. Uh, though I'm not an attorney, uh, among other things, as uh, Andrew mentioned, I work as an advisor on public policy matters uh, to the FIDO Alliance. So I want to start off today with talking at a high level about what PSD2 is and, and some of the requirements when it comes to strong customer authentication. So PSD2, the, the best way to view it is it's an attempt to drive innovation in financial services through regulation. Uh, it's a new directive that regulates banks, payment services, and other related financial services throughout the European Union and the broader European economic area. And there's a few goals. Uh, one is to increase competition and participation in financial services and payments markets by creating the path for entities that aren't banks, that what we'll call TPPs or third-party providers, uh, including account information service providers. These are entities that will gather data uh, on uh, users' different financial accounts and put together a unified view of their finances and perhaps offer advice, as well as entities known as payment initiation service providers, uh, essentially entities that may not hold your payment account but users can still choose to pay through them. So the goal at a high level is to open up financial services so consumers have non-bank choices in payments and financial services, and we want to improve consumer protection. So some key provisions that are out there. At the core, uh, there's a mandate that all banks in Europe have a, uh, to open up what they call access to account, uh, leveraging uh, open APIs. And we'll talk more about how that works in the slides ahead. Uh, with this, there's a new mandate for strong customer authentication so that when uh, these APIs are being used, you actually know who you're dealing with. And there's some new defined roles for the third-party providers. Um, the, the graphic below really shows you know, how a lot of this will work, and it starts with the person who's at the center, which is uh, the consumer, who will have to give consent uh, to either their AISP or their PISP uh, for those firms to then access information and perhaps even money uh, in different banks that they may uh, do business with through open APIs. And that's really at the core of, of what we're trying to enable with PSD2. Now, why does strong customer authentication matter? Well, we're coming up on 25 years this July of uh, the anniversary of the famous Pete Steiner cartoon in The New Yorker. Um, 
I think 25 in dog years means both of these dogs have died and now this is probably their, their great grandkids or whatever engaging in this. Uh, but the problem is still the same, which is how do you actually know uh, who you're dealing with online? And as a consumer, if I'm going to let a, a payment initiation service provider or an account information service provider either access data from my bank account or transfer money from my bank account for a payment, it's important that my bank has a way to authenticate me, to know that I'm not actually a dog, and to know that I have specifically authorized this third party uh, to take these actions with regard to my bank account. And this can still be a tricky thing. So how this has largely been done today is you know, what I'll refer to as credential caching and screen scraping, where the third party will ask me for my username and password, I'll give it to them, and then they'll then store it, uh, and then uh, log in with my credentials that I gave them to uh, my bank account through the consumer-facing interface, sometimes several times a day. And then once they're in, they'll collect, also known as screen scraping, all of my account data to support their service. So there's a few problems with screen scraping. One, we tell people, never share your password. Yet we're asking people here to trust a third party with their username and password. Uh, among other things, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, when I've been asked for this several times with services I've tried to use, it looks like a poorly crafted phishing attack. This, you know, really runs contrary to everything we're trying to promote in terms of sound cybersecurity practices. Second, passwords are fundamentally insecure. Uh, I think most folks are familiar with, you know, the statistic we see from the Verizon data breach report showing that 81% of breaches a year ago were tied to passwords. If you're letting additional parties store passwords and other shared secrets, it raises risks uh, in what we really want to be uh, very secure uh, transactions. Uh, it also, screen scraping, can uh, break some of the tools that protect the login process that banks use, including stronger forms of multi-factor authentication that don't rely on static shared secrets and behavior analytics. Third, there's some really significant issues with screen scraping when it comes to privacy and consent. Because I may think I'm only granting access to a small part of my account, but the third party provider may get access to all of it. And with screen scraping, there's not a way for a consumer to authorize access on a granular level. Um, also raises some pretty significant concerns with GDPR coming online later this month in terms of the inability uh, to revoke access or only grant access to some aspects of my account, but, but not others. So the good news is there's ways to actually address this, leveraging open APIs. With open APIs, third parties can securely connect to a bank. There isn't a need to uh, cache passwords or even collect them. Banks can share data directly with the third parties, uh, no screen scraping is needed, and banks can enable third party payment providers to initiate the payment. And what's particularly great about APIs, if they're implemented correctly, is customers can let their bank know that they explicitly authorize access to some parts of their account, but not all, and they can actively manage access that these third parties get on a granular level. So this is good. Uh, shifting to uh, some of the key dates that are around right now for the strong customer authentication requirements for PSD2. So while PSD2 is in effect, it's took some time for the European Commission uh, and the European Banking Authority to actually sort out the regulatory technical standards for strong customer authentication, the part that really makes uh, a lot of these transactions secure. So the final regulatory technical standard, or RTS as it's known, uh, was published last November. And there's an effective date for the RTS of September 2019. But the real date that, that really matters quite a bit is rolling back six months earlier to March 2019, or just about 10 months from today, because banks need to be ready six months before the effective date of the RTS. Uh, and when I say ready, it means that they have to have some interfaces available in say a sandbox setting that they can make available to uh, third party providers uh, for testing. So all of this means that uh, decisions in terms of you know, what different players in the financial services sector are going to do uh, need to be made uh, quite quickly. So I want to dig in a little deeper now to what the specific uh, strong customer authentication rules require. As I mentioned, the RTS was finalized a few months ago. What it says is that for secure transactions, you require multi-factor authentication, leveraging at least two of three elements. You can use something you know, such as a password or PIN, something you possess, such as a phone or a token uh, or uh, a card, and then finally something you are, uh, generally a biometric. So you don't need all three of them, but you can leverage any two of the three in combination uh, to deliver strong customer authentication. And the way the RTS is written, uh, they don't specify a lot beyond that. I would say it's more principles focused as opposed to prescriptive. 
However, one area that they did get prescriptive was when they looked at the concept of what they called multi-purpose devices, uh, which would generally be the easiest example to look at as a smartphone. So what if I'm leveraging a smartphone uh, for a transaction and I want to deliver two independent authentication factors within that single device without requiring somebody to have some sort of a second token or some other element. And when the European Banking Authority and the European Commission were looking at this in the, over the, the last couple of years, uh, it, it took them quite some time to get comfortable with the concept of this because the concern was that you need that guarantee independence of the authentication elements uh, to point out that if one of them is compromised, the other is not compromised. And so one concern was that, um, with a smartphone, if a device is compromised, uh, then are both factories compromised? So they settled on an approach um, in the final uh, RTS that stated that you can actually do this if you put several mitigating measures in place. And the first thing that they highlighted was the use of separated secure execution environments. Think the trusted execution environment in an Android phone or the secure enclave uh, in an Apple device, a uh, TPM chip uh, in a Windows device. Uh, that can basically be used to isolate one of the factors from the rest of the device so that if the device itself is compromised, uh, the authentication factor is not. And as Brett and Alan will talk about a little bit later today, uh, the use of these separated secure execution environments points very uh, uh, squarely at the FIDO standards. In fact, FIDO is built around uh, applications uh, for use cases where you want to be able to guarantee two separate authentication factors that are independent in a single device. It is the standard that enables it using any biometric and, uh, and, and any uh, multi-purpose device that's out there today. The RTS also put some requirements in place around user experience. Uh, so there were some concerns from the European Commission that banks might build bad APIs or otherwise put obstacles in place that might make it difficult uh, for third parties to access consumer accounts. And one of the things they highlighted was that a redirect model uh, may be an obstacle. There's been some confusion on this in that some people have looked at this language in Article 32 and said, well, redirect is always an obstacle. But if you actually talk to the European Commission, they've been clear it was just an example, and there actually may be redirect implementations that don't cause obstacles. Uh, what's important is that there's obstacles, there's mandates that banks uh, shift to a fallback option not using the API that goes back to caching customers' banking passwords, which obviously has security and privacy problems. So everybody's heavily incented uh, to not go back to that option and to come up with uh, very user-friendly experiences. So there's some implications here in that the redirect model is an industry-accepted best practice for how consumers can log into accounts with a credential uh, from uh, another entity. It's based on proven standards, including not just FIDO, but OAuth2 and OpenID Connect, there's dozens of vendors lined up behind it. And in fact, in the UK, you've seen the Open Banking Implementation Entity already build standards on redirect. So the key uh, for firms that are looking to implement in Europe is how, if you want to use redirect, do you implement it with an excellent user experience? And this is where FIDO has good news for implementers. FIDO implementations deliver a very streamlined authentication process that can deliver strong customer authentication much more efficiently than other first generation, more burdensome MFA tools that are out there. Um, real quick, I get asked a lot being in Washington, will we see something like PSD2 in the US? Uh, my take is no, I, I don't think regulation uh, is coming. Uh, the US is not looking um, to force action this way, but it is clear that open banking and open payments is happening in the US. I think the key is whether industry can figure it out themselves rather than have the government prescribe how to do it. And in that regard, a really good thing happened back in February when the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center, the FSISAC, published uh, their data sharing API to help enable uh, open sharing, uh, open banking in the U.S. Uh, on the left, I said, if you want to copy, reach out to Eric Arena, the FSISAC. I mentioned that because it's not uh, published, but if you request it uh, as somebody who's interested in what's happening in the U.S. market, FSISAC uh, is, is likely to be willing to share it with you. Uh, and so this is something that was a voluntary multi-stakeholder approach in the U.S. to try and solve this problem rather than rely on government intervention and regulation. So highlights of the FSISAC approach, uh, like in Europe, it's looking to standard APIs to secure third-party access. Um, and, you know, what I want to highlight is that they specifically recommend a suite of standards in there to enable this, uh, leveraging OAuth2, OpenID Connect, and the FIDO standards. And in fact, on the next slide, I you know, excerpted a, a few um, uh, uh, statements 
from the control considerations that are tied to the FSISEC document where they flag these three standards uh, and specifically point out that, that FIDO forms the design pattern for authenticating the consumer uh, to allow maximum interoperability to better support public applications. And they specifically uh, recommend uh, use of uh, FIDO uh, you know, for this purpose. In fact, if you look at the, the document, FIDO is mentioned 83 separate times in the FSISAC document, which uh, from FIDO's perspective uh, is a great recognition of the maturity of its standards and uh, as well as you know how it's being used across the financial ecosystem in the U.S. and abroad. So you know this is another example of, of what you see happening with open banking in other parts of the world. So uh, with that, I'm going to now turn things over to my colleague Brett McDowell, who is the executive director of FIDO Alliance, and he'll tell you more about uh, the FIDO standards themselves. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, it's a great way to get us started today. Um, and my privilege today is to give you a quick recap of how FIDO works in all of its flavors, tell you about our new standards, which uh, have glowing endorsements from all the world's leading uh, web browser developers and are coming to market in a very big way over the coming months. That's the FIDO2 project. And then I will, you know, after giving you some of this level setting information about how FIDO works and the state of standardization, we'll turn it over to Alan, who's going to take you through, you know, its specific considerations as you plan your uh, PSD2 strong customer authentication uh, compliance strategy. So first, the problem that FIDO solves uh, is, you know, colloquially described as the password problem. Here is some data that uh, underpins why we think this is a problem. This really comes in two parts. First, there's a security problem with passwords. Uh, if you, th this data is, you know, is alarming not only because of how bad it is with, you know, over 1,500 uh, data breaches this past year, but the rate that this problem is getting worse. So we know that over 80% of the data breaches studied uh, can be attributed to compromised credentials, the password in particular. We know that one out of 14 uh, social engineering phishing attacks um, are successful in one example. There are many studies of that nature. And that we now have um, a 45% increase year over year in reported data breaches. So this problem is not only bad and very expensive, but it's getting worse at an alarming pace. Now on the usability side, it's nothing that people don't already know. Passwords are a hassle. Your customers are hassled by passwords. They don't want to have to use them. The industry has done the best it can, uh, you know, taking the assumption that you have to deal with passwords. You know, their password managers, browsers are trying to get uh, users to store their passwords. Um, sessions don't time out pretty much anymore. Uh, but you still, you know, when you pick up that new device, when you try to do it, a checkout at a merchant that you haven't been at for a while, you're still going to run into that uh, user experience where you have to remember where your password was, you're going to have to come up with it, or worse, you're going to have to do a password recovery flow. And just too many customers abandon the checkout uh, process at that point. So we have serious usability and security problems to solve. So FIDO took the approach that there has to be a fundamental change in the nature of online authentication. Uh, we've, we've already seen uh, the failed attempt to improve upon the password problem when we introduced one-time passcodes um, and, and even standardization around one-time passcodes. Uh, that did improve security, uh, but it worsened the user experience. And we know that the consumers who uh, opt in, which is most of the, of the world's marketplace, you're not compelled to use that second factor. Most of the world that uses one-time passcodes, you know, it's single digits uh, of user acceptance. So it's not tenable. You're not gonna solve the security and fraud problem by giving people the option to add extra steps in the process. So instead of this being a trade-off between security and usability, um, we, just, we believe that you could, with a fundamental innovation from the ground up, 
end up with both something that's more secure and easier to use. Now, to get more secure, we use public key cryptography, so we don't end up with any shared secrets on the server. The, your secret is now created by your device, stays on your device, it is never shared. That takes away all those social engineering attacks, um, and it takes away all the replay attacks. If someone does suffer a data breach, well, the attacker doesn't have credentials they can use against you at your website. So that's how we get there on a security level. On the usability side, we simply create user verification as an abstraction layer on top of this public key infrastructure, uh, which means that you would simply have to provide some way for the user to unlock that private key, and you trust the device to do that unlocking for you. Uh, that enables innovation to happen, and we've seen quite a bit of innovation since the FIDO Alliance was launched in early 2013. Um, now we have, you know, biometrics are pretty much ubiquitous on our smart devices, and security keys um, are coming in lots of different form factors. So between the two, you have a simple one gesture, you know, single gesture, touch something, look at something, maybe speak to something, and you unlock your private key and you authenticate. So here is a diagram that shows that in action to kind of help you, you know, let this sink in and it'll help you give you a bit of a technical foundation uh, for Alan's talk later about how this is going to work in the wild. So the user has a personal device of some kind, their PC, their tablet, their phone, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, what the regulation refers to as a multi-purpose device. And they uh, register with the service. So, you know, one day they log into your service and they're greeted with an invitation. Oh, would you like to register, uh, let's say, you know, your fingerprint uh, so you won't have to use passwords from this device anymore? So, yes, I would. And you do this one-time verification like, yes, I'm the user who's enrolled in, with the fingerprint uh, template on my device. And the FIDO authenticator, this is a capability. Don't think of this as a thing, think of it as a capability. Either your phone, your tablet, your PC has that ability, or uh, you can have a security key, which is a dedicated portable device in convenient form factors that, you, that works over Bluetooth, NFC, or USB, so it will work with any device you have in your life, and you can use that as a dedicated hard token second factor. So, uh, and get the capability that way, even if your main multipurpose device doesn't have it. Um, so in that scenario, uh, your authenticator creates the key pair. Um, the public key is sent to the application. So instead of storing username, password, that uh, what's, what they're storing is username and FIDO credential public key. This is a public key that's matched to your unique private key. Uh, every time the user registers credentials, they are unique to every application. There's no duplication of credentials. Um, and the, the authenticator will only sign challenges from the application that it registered with. And that, key, again, that breaks all those man in the middle attacks that, that we hear about with passwords and even one-time passcodes. Here is a uh, sample. This is a, a relatively small sample of some of the leading companies in the world who are already delivering FIDO compliant solutions to market. Uh, this represents hundreds of millions of devices already uh, enabled to perform FIDO authentication and honestly uh, uh, billions of users and user accounts that have FIDO authentication uh, at least as an opt-in and in some cases uh, you know, ubiquitously supported for the application. So a couple of examples. Uh, Facebook uh, has offered, you know, along with Google and many of the companies listed up here, FIDO as a sec optional second factor. So uh, what they call security key. So you can opt in instead of, uh, you know, or in addition to those one-time passcodes, you can say, um, I would like to use my security key as my stronger, easier to use second factor. Other companies listed here, uh, such as PayPal, Bank of America, uh, what they're doing is they're using the embedded authenticator on the device. So that fingerprint sensor um, is performing FIDO authentication behind the scenes uh, for the user. So when you do that fingerprint authentication, that's actually a multi-factor authentication event that's taking place. 
So we have some of the leading services in the world already deploying this at scale. This is no longer a proof of concept. This is no longer a pilot. This is now common practice, and it's going to become a lot more common for the following reason. Our latest uh, specification effort is called the FIDO2 project. Um, so in addition to FIDO UAF, which is Universal Authentication Framework, and FIDO U2F, Universal Second Factor, those are specifications we first published in, at the end of 2014 as final standards, uh, published by the FIDO Alliance. The FIDO2 project is a collaboration with the W3C where we uh, continue to standardize within FIDO Alliance the client to authenticator protocols. These are the protocols that allow a multi-purpose device to work with an external authenticator, whether that be a security key or even something like a smartphone as your external authenticator to sessions running on your PC. Uh, WebAuthn is the uh, web API, the API that your website would build to and your web server would build to, uh, to support FIDO authentication on the web. That is standardized by the W3C. Uh, based on contributions that we submitted a couple years ago. So what that does is it brings FIDO authentication into the web platform ubiquitously. The W3C is where all web browsers uh, pick up their standards uh, to support. And recently we announced with the W3C uh, that the web authentic uh, specification has reached what they call candidate recommendation which essentially means this is now an invitation for uh, commercial implementation. So it's ready for commercial uh, uh, implementation, not only in the browser, but also the websites and web servers. And we, on the right-hand side here, we can see some of the companies and their current level of participation. So uh, Google, but with both native Android API for native Android apps, uh, the st status there is they've announced support for uh, the FIDO2 specifications, and they already support FIDO U2F. Um, with their Chrome browser, uh, they've, uh, they already have uh, U2F that they've been supporting for years, and now they're saying that they, uh, they actually have a build of FIDO2, uh, it's kind of a developer build of Chrome, and so that's coming mainstream very soon. Um, let's talk about Microsoft. Windows 10 uh, has made a public commitment that the Windows Hello system is compliant with FIDO2. Uh, they're, they're, they're currently uh, shipping it that way. That's the way it works with the latest uh, Windows 10 upgrade. And uh, they're even ahead of our certification program, which is coming in the next few months, um, but they've committed to becoming certified with Windows Hello. Uh, that's for both logging into web applications as well as logging into native applications and provisioning desktops. A lot of really interesting enterprise use cases supported by Microsoft from uh, all of their Azure offerings down to their Windows desktops. And the Edge browser, uh, that was demonstrated, a, a pre-shipping version of that was demonstrated recently at uh, the RSA Security Conference, and the, that will come into their mainstream uh, production version of the browser later this year. And Apple. Uh, the WebKit engineers uh, who build the Safari browser, uh, they are participants in the web authentication working group, and on their roadmap, they say they are evaluating uh, supporting web authent. So that's the status with Apple. However, another thing to say about the Apple platform is because Face ID and Touch ID have an open a an API, I mean, proprietary API that anyone can build to, several uh, FIDO certified SDKs exist for you to build a FIDO UAF compliant solution that works with Touch ID and Face ID. And I anticipate uh, there will be uh, implementations, SDKs to help you do that with FIDO 2. And last but not least, a word about backwards compatibility. So a few things to know. With FIDO 2, the, there is built-in backwards compatibility within the protocol for U2F authenticators, right? So FIDO2 um, is a very close cousin to U2F. It supports more use cases, um, but it, so it was easy to build in backwards compatibility for security keys. So if you have a U2F security key and websites start saying that they support FIDO2, um, 
rest assured you're going to be able to use that security key to log into those FIDO2 websites. Uh, UAF is, is a bit of a different architecture. Um, and so to get backwards compatibility with all those UAF smartphones, and there are hundreds of millions of them already in the marketplace, you would need a universal server on the web server side. Um, you want to uh, server side, uh, uh, FIDO enable your infrastructure with a vendor solution that has the universal server badge. That means that that solution supports UAF, U2F, and FIDO2. And the promise there is that any FIDO certified authenticator, no matter what version of the specifications, no matter when it was certified, it's going to interoperate with your infrastructure. And with that, um, I am happy to hand off to Alan to talk more about the situation uh, kind of where the rubber meets the road in implementing uh, FIDO authentication for your PSD2 compliance. Alan? Thank you, Brett. So indeed, uh, in this last part of, the, of this webinar, we're going to now look at the main challenges and uh, how FIDO can actually help. So the bank challenges we're talking about are not on implementing PSD2, which is a very vast subject, but on the uh, specific uh, component of strong customer authentication. What we're going to look at is uh, the challenges of deployment, of compliance, uh, and we'll see that there is a, this is a big, bit of a vague notion today, and the customer journey, which is a very hot topic. On the deployment challenges, the uh, regulation actually says that all of the users of a bank have to be able to access their bank accounts and authenticate strongly. And this uh, notion of 100% means that a bank will most certainly have to deploy a variety of devices. Again, in, in this uh, strong customer authentication, there is a notion of the possession factor that is to say a device that you have and not everybody will have the same access some will be on pcs some will be on smartphones some will use a smartphone to authenticate some will use uh, a, a, a usb key and so on and so forth and so if a bank is not going to use a standard this means that the bank will multiply uh, its uh, solutions and uh, increase its costs and fido standards um, Brett just mentioned that through the use of the FIDO Universal Cell Server has the ability to uh, streamline the investment, reuse a single server to authenticate whichever the device the end user is using. FIDO actually has another benefit when it comes to deployment, uh, which is linked to the specifics of FIDO, and that is the ability uh, for a bank to accept uh, that the user uses a device that they already have. And this can be achieved by, thanks to the specifics, there's three aspects of this that makes this possible. The first one that we already uh, mentioned is that with FIDO, in the device, in the authenticator, the keys are generated locally. The keys are generated within the device. And FIDO uses uh, public key cryptography. So key pairs are generated and the private key stays in the device. The public key is uploaded to the server. And so in effect, if a user already has a security key or already has uh, you know, an SDK inside a, a mobile phone, inside a banking application, this can be reused to access to the bank server. Now there is a question if, uh, the bank allows this to happen, which is the trust. How can the bank trust the device? And FIDO provides a mechanism to actually verify that the device is genuine. This is through a device attestation mechanism, which we don't have time to describe, but that exists. And the third question a bank may have is, is the device secure enough? And does it comply with my security policy? And for this, uh, FIDO proposes a mechanism to upload uh, the characteristics of this device from a server, a, a metadata server that can be a public one, FIDO proposes one, or a 
private one specific to each and every vendor. And so through the combination of these three characteristics of the FIDO standards, it is possible to use existing devices to establish strong customer authentication. In terms of challenges of compliance, um, so you will have heard of the regulatory technical standards, the RTS. They defined a large number of principles, but they don't define what is exactly a compliance solution. Nevertheless, FIDO, uh, we believe, is actually in line with the requirements of the RTS. And the first one being the multi-factor authentication. I think that was made clear uh, in the past presentation. The other aspect is the, the security offered by FIDO. And here, uh, again, you have uh, versatility and uh, a number of possibilities to implement or choose from in terms of security um, environment. So FIDO solutions can run in pure software, hardened with security techniques, or trusted execution environments, or TPMs, or in secure elements in, in pure hardware. Finally, uh, the FIDO standards um, focus quite a lot on biometrics and the notion of data privacy, which I'll explain uh, right now. Indeed, uh, FIDO helps to comply with GDPR. You've probably heard a lot of, uh, of uh, discussions around, uh, is PSD2 compliant with GDPR? Uh, is screen scraping compliant with GDPR? And so on and so forth. And so uh, FIDO can definitely help because of its, um, the principles of uh, the standards. In particular, with FIDO, there are no shared secrets. The, the bank keys, as I explained, are uh, generated in the device and only the public key is uploaded to the bank server. The private key never leaves the device, it is not shared. And the same goes by with the, the verification of the user. Whether it's a PIN or a biometric, the verification is done locally inside the device. And this is in line with the privacy by design aspect of the GDPR. Finally, in terms of compliance, as I said, uh, there is a bit of uh, an unknown here because uh, the, the um, directive and the RTS actually uh, don't specify what a compliance solution is. And it is up to the national competent authorities to do so. But they haven't done so yet, and it's unclear when they will. And so there is a bit of ga a gap here in terms of, uh, am I going to buy a solution that will make me compliant with the, the regulation. Here FIDO can help because FIDO comes with a certification program. So FIDO certifies functionally all of the devices that are submitted through interoperability sessions. FIDO also has a security certification program uh, with a certain number of, uh, of different security levels, some of which are bank grade security levels. And even if this is not uh, defined yet by national competent authorities, we believe that the FIDO certification program can be a good basis for a bank to make sure that they implement strong customer authentication in a proper way. Finally, the, the last uh, challenge of the banks is the, the customer journey. And so, uh, you heard from Jeremy this issue that came up in the last version of the RTS around uh, the creation of obstacles and whether the redirection uh, is an obstacle or not. And so here we, we see that there are a number of models that are now emerging uh, from the works of the API standardization bodies in Europe. And so the first one is indeed a redirection model. So in the redirection model, you start from a, a, a TPP interface. In this example, this would be a PISP interface and you're redirected to the bank for authentication before it being redirected back for completion. Uh, there is no doubt whatsoever that FIDO works in this model. Actually, FIDO is designed to work in this model. And so there is absolutely no issue at all. The other model that is uh, emerging from the works of the API standardization body is called a decoupled model. And in this model, uh, 
the user is uh, redirected now to a specific device. So the RTS uh, do not explain what this device is, but let's say that a simple way of implementing the decoupled model is by using a smartphone with a dedicated application of the bank. And so you would start from a TPP user interface uh, and your phone would wake up uh, and the transaction details would be displayed and you would authenticate at this stage to authorize this transaction. And so FIDO here again uh, is perfectly able to work in this model. As uh, Brett was saying, we have a number of implementations out there on smartphones already operational. There are a number of advantages to these two models. Um, one of the most important ones being the fact that this is the most simple way for a bank to do it. And so from a timing perspective, you remember the date of March 2019, there is no doubt that these two models are the fastest way for a bank to implement strong customer authentication. And by the way, these two models are in line with what banks are going to do for their own services. One important aspect of this, uh, this has been shown in a you know, number of discussions, is that uh, actually some users will be quite happy with uh, these two models because they're comfortable in authenticating from within the interface of their bank. They trust their bank, they're familiar with the authentication solution of their bank, and so they will be glad to do the same even when uh, using the services of a TPP. Now, the device, the, sorry, the, uh, the uh, this redirection or decoupled model could generate some friction for aggregation, account aggregation use cases. And so here an example of what could happen, I don't know if it would ever happen, but it could in theory, uh, if you're aggregating accounts from three different banks and these th three different banks have actually uh, totally different uh, ways of authenticating the user, it could become cumbersome to actually uh, use the service of the account aggregator. And so one way of, of uh, resolving uh, this issue is to use federated identity. When you use federated identity, you use the services of an identity provider, an IDP, uh, which then de delivers access tokens to, that uh, banks use to grant access to the TPP. So FIDO has been working with uh, authorization frameworks and, and with federated identity models and it works perfectly in these models. So there is absolutely no difficulty to use FIDO in, in these federated identity systems. The last model that the API standardization bodies are looking at is a model where the end user never, lose, never leaves the user interface of the TPP. And so authentication by the bank happens from the TPP interface. And so FIDO uh, looks is, uh, is looking at this uh, in, in terms of how to implement an em embedded model in a user-friendly way and has a solution that can work uh, whereby you would uh, uh, use a device with bank keys inside the device and authenticate uh, from the TPP interface without leaving that interface but with the verification nevertheless done by the bank. So we don't have time to, at all to go through the details of how this works, but if you're interested, we do have a white paper and we'll be glad to take questions. So FIDO is engaged with standardization bodies on all of this. Uh, we are uh, working with them to see if they will, for example, support challenge response mechanisms to the open APIs that would be a requirement for the embedded model to work. We're looking at the other implications, and so these are ongoing discussions. So just to finish, a few key takeaways before we move on to the Q&A session. Um, FIDO standards, we believe, are a good solution because they, are, they, they do meet the requirements of the RTS. They, they, are, they implement privacy by design, which is an essential aspect of the GDPR, and they work with authorization frameworks. As I said, they, order, they allow banks to maximize reach, which is an, an absolute must. And finally, banks can use FIDO to support the redirection and decoupled models, which will definitely be the easiest to implement at the beginning, but leaves the options open to do more and to implement the embedded model with TPPs that wish to integrate FIDO authentication in their solutions. 
And with that, we'll uh, move to the Q&A session. Andrew? Thanks, Alan. <clears throat> and thanks, Jeremy and Brett as well. Um, so that, that brings us to the end of our, our contents today. Uh, we will now open things up for Q&A. Uh, again, please enter your questions into the GoToWebinar client and we'll answer them um, uh, now. Uh, before getting started, I did want to let you know that there are two white papers uh, pertaining to FIDO's perspectives on PSD2. Uh, those are also available in the Go to, Go to Webinar client, so you should see a little carrot that says handouts. Uh, you can download, download those directly from that, that, that area. Uh, additionally, we'll include links in our, our follow-up email um, after the webinar. So with that, uh, let me get into some of the questions here. So um, how is dynamic dynamic linking supported? Um, Brett or Alan, do you want to, to address that? Sure. So dynamic linking uh, is uh, the ability to um, digitally sign uh, the details of the transaction in order to provide an authentication code which dynamically links the user and its authenticator to the transaction details. And so, uh, yes, FIDO can support uh, uh, dynamic linking through a mechanism which is called transaction confirmation, which is exactly uh, the, the, the principle of dynamic linking. The transaction details are displayed, the user validates, and uh, the, the device, the FIDO authenticator, generates a signature that takes into account the transaction details. Yeah, and Alan, if I could just add, um, I think the way the uh, requirements were written may have been a little confusing because if I'm not mistaken, they used the word code um, for some of this when they described this use case and of adding a dynamic code and that sort of thing. And um, through our you know, educational outreach with the, the regulators, uh, I think we have a common understanding that you know, a, a the digital signature that the private key can apply to the transaction not only meets the intent and outcome of that language, but is frankly even a more secure way of adding a dynamic code, if you will. It's, so it's not a, a human readable number. Um, it's a bunch of, you know, it's a digital signature. So if you've ever seen that, it's a bunch of gobbledygook, uh, but that does comply, you know, with that language. So in case anyone's out there thinking, oh, I see the word code, that means I need some kind of OTP-based solution. That's not the case. Okay. So a, a general question here, uh, how does FIDO prevent social engineering? Um, as we know, social engineering is, prevalent in account takeover attempts, phishing attempts, things like that. So Grant, maybe you could talk about how, how FIDO addresses this. Sure, so very simply, um, the FIDO authenticator won't sign transactions that come to it, right? So FIDO is a challenge response protocol. Um, and when the challenge is sent from the online application, whether it's a web, application or a native application, uh, the authenticator, which is device side, uh, sees the transaction. And uh, one of the things that it's looking for, you know, is the web origin, uh, the domain name uh, that it previously registered with. And if the challenge comes from a different domain, so even though you can fool the user um, into seeing something that, that looks like the name of your bank, but it's different, we call that a cousin domain. Um, you can trick the user, but you can't trick the authenticator. So it won't sign a challenge, so it won't create a session. Uh, that's a, a, actually a very basic fundamental uh, truth of all FIDO authentication. In addition to that, there are some advanced attacks um, that involve you know, session hijacking, uh, where you can actually compromise the website certificate. Uh, so if you remember a few years ago, this was happening quite a bit in uh, cyber cafes with something called Fire Sheep. Um, I mean, you know, a coffee house that has internet connectivity. Uh, and uh, for, for any advanced attack where you, the attackers actually compromise the session, 
FIDO still has a defense, and that is um, the IETF token binding support. So uh, the FIDO, FIDO2, UAF, and U2F all reference token binding. And we have a great uh, tech note on FIDOalliance.org uh, written by one of the lead uh, security engineers at Google about exactly that feature. And uh, you know maybe we can put a link to that in the follow-up email. Yeah, we'll, and we'll get that in the chat box here momentarily as well. Um, more detailed question is RASP. So I think that's real-time application security protection uh, mandatory for authenticator implementation. Um, are there any device tampering risk signals passed to FIDO's server for risk evaluation? And then likewise, a follow-up question that, you know, what exactly is passed as personalized security credentials in an embedded flow? So I'll try and answer that one. So um, there's a lot of debates around the implementation of the embedded model. And uh, some of uh, you know, the outcome of workshops on this model is indeed the notion of passing security credentials through the TPP interface. When you look into the details of what uh, these people are, are looking at, they're actually looking at um, very specific implementations. In other words, their idea is that you would pass through the TPP interface um, a password and a digital signature that would be entered manually by the end user. In other words, they have a, a device uh, that will display uh, a one-time password of some kind that would be entered manually in the interface of the TPP. And this is not at all the approach that FIDO is, is taking and is looking at to implement the embedded model. We, we are looking at a challenge response mechanism where um, the, uh, the, the private key stored in the device encrypts a challenge. And prior to doing that, there must be a user gesture before, okay? either touching a USB key or entering a pin code or a scanning a fingerprint. For example, and this all this is done locally. So in the model of FIDO, there is no such thing as transmitting user credentials through the TPP interface. This is very different. Okay. Um, there's a question, can a user use FIDO from cloud instances? Is there a virtual implementation of U2F? I believe those are actually separate questions, but Brett, do you want to address those? Sorry, Andrew, can you uh, repeat the first question? Uh, the first question, can a user use FIDO from cloud instances? And is there a virtual implementation of U2F? Can you use it from cloud? Um, uh, so maybe the question implies some confusion, I'll, I'll try to answer the question. So from a cloud instance, uh, so if you're running your application on, you know, like a shared cloud infrastructure, uh, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, et cetera, um, then, you know, you're implementing FIDO at the web application layer. So uh, of course you can run FIDO on a, a cloud instance. Um, just as you can, you know, run the rest of your web infrastructure on top of a cloud instance. Um, is there a virtual implementation? So that might mean, is there kind of a software client solution for uh, U2F? The answer is yes. Uh, Intel uh, recently was kind of uh, promoting their, um, they would not really call it a software authentication because it's tied to uh, their uh, security chip uh, on an Intel-enabled PC, but they do have a U2F solution that doesn't involve an external piece of hardware. Um, when the when the U2F challenge comes up, uh, then your a little box appears on the screen in a protected display. It's not part of the web browser. It's part of you know the 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 OS is showing that to you, and then you click. Uh, a button with your mouse and you've just done a U2F signature. So that's the kind of solution that exists. Maybe that answered the question, uh, maybe it didn't. Okay, so if the individual asks a question as follow-up, please put it in the, uh, in the chat box. 
Um, <clears throat> Follow-up question to the prior uh, RASP question. Are, are there any device tampering risk signals passed to the FIDO server for, for risk evaluation? Uh, so during during the authentication process, are there risk signals passed to the FIDO server for risk evaluation? I'll, I'll take that. So um, the FIDO, let's talk about FIDO in the context of, uh, you know, device fingerprinting solutions that are out there. So device fingerprinting up until now it has meant we're looking at lots of different signals. You know, we're reading, you know, you know, smartphones have tons of APIs. You can, an application can get up to a lot of data off the, of a device. The same thing, you know, browser string and other information available on the PC. And you're looking at all of those details, you know, like the size of the, the number of contacts you have. There are lots of different things you can evaluate as an application to try to decide, is this the same machine that my real user has used before? It's a way to identify, is there someone who stole the credentials that is trying to authenticate into the account? Is this an unknown machine, untrusted machine? And then you act accordingly, maybe a step of authentication. So in that context, the way FIDO plays is, um, FIDO is giving you a deterministic cryptographic proof that it's the same machine. So that that signature that you get proves that only the private key <coughs> registered and bound to that device could have provided you that result. Now, your confidence in that comes down to how much do you trust the device to not lose the private key it created? You know, how easy is it for an attacker to get the FIDO credential off that device? Sure, the FIDO is designed to not share, but what sort of private key attacks can you defend? And to answer that, we have a security certification program with various levels of security. And so what you do know, what you do get in terms of risk signals that get passed, not the general device fingerprinting probabilistic uh, picture. So FIDO works within those systems. So it's additive, it doesn't replace that. Um, what you get from FIDO is device attestation. So you get a you get a proof that this is the device that was manufactured by the company who claims they manufactured it. It is the model that it claims to be. It has the uh, capability it claims to have. All of that's cryptographically verified through attestation in something called the FIDO metadata registry, which is a public registry that we make available as a as a public service um, of all certified FIDO authenticators. So you'll know you'll know whatever the vendor wants you to know about that authenticator. You might know the false accept rate. You might know this. The, the, you'll certainly know this uh, certification status. You'll know what level of security it's certified to, and that will give you an indicator on how to score that session in your risk-based backend because you'll know, oh, this authenticator is not vulnerable at all to, let's say, you know, malware attacks on the private key. There's no way the malware is gonna be able to get the private key from this. It's a level two authenticator. Or even more, even if the device was stolen, there's no way they're gonna lift the private key off even in a lab. It's a three plus certified authenticator. So that's a long way, kind of brings in the attestation and metadata aspects of FIDO. But that is the, you know, I think the complete answer about what sort of risk-based signals do you get from FIDO. Maybe I would add that, because um, in PSD2, there is this important notion of exemptions based on the context, based on the history, and so on. And so uh, a bank uh, may decide or not to apply FIDO authentication based on the analysis of this transaction context. And for that, uh, the TPP must pass, or the TPP or the merchant must pass contextual information. Uh, for example, uh, in the implementations of uh, Visa and MasterCard, 3D Secure, 3D Secure V2 more specifically, allows the merchant to pass quite a lot of details on the transaction context to the bank in order for the bank to make a decision. But this, these protocols are outside of the scope of FIDO. Okay. Very good. So <clears throat> that brings us to the end of our hour here today. Uh, so thank you all very much for, for, your, for your questions. There are a few outstanding uh, in the queue that we will uh, aim to answer via email. If anyone else has further questions, you can always email us at info at FIDOalliance.org and, and a member of the FIDO team uh, will come back to you as, as soon as possible.
Um, additionally, as you see here on the screen, uh, there are added white papers and resources available on our website, phytoalliance.org, and you can follow us on Twitter at, at phytoalliance. Uh, so I'd like to thank all our speakers again today for um, delivering their presentations to you. Thank all of you for attending. Um, when you exit, uh, please do take a moment to fill out the survey. We great, greatly appreciate your feedback. And last but not least, again, an archive of this will be made available in the next 36 hours on the uh, Fido Alliance website, so on the webinar page and also on our YouTube channel. So thank you all very much, and we we'll look forward to catching you on one of our future Fido uh, webinars. Thank you.